Joining us is constitutional law scholar and Harvard Law School professor Lawrence Tribe. So, Professor, to keep this conversation going about uh, what has happened at these committees, but also the new revelations that have come out through reporting and through the hearings, I want to start with Jenny Thomas, <laughs> uh, because I think it's really unprecedented, feels like an overused word at this point, to have the wife of a Supreme Court justice caught up in the middle of this larger conspiracy, allegedly, that we're learning about through these hearings. But talk us through it. What were your main takeaways from the latest committee hearings now that we have this new reporting about Ginny Thomas laid on top of all of this? Well, the Ginny Thomas story is interesting, but it's really a sideshow. It's an important sideshow in the sense that if her husband, Justice Clarence Thomas, um, had his way, we wouldn't really know about all of the conversations between Ginny Thomas and this weirdo, John Eastland. Uh, John Eastman would have not come to the surface in connection with her, and therefore we wouldn't have known the full extent of the conspiracy. The reason that's true is that the court voted eight to one, with the one being uh, Justice Thomas dissenting, that the National Archives had to release all sorts of information that included information about the justice's wife. So among other things, he was violating the federal statute that requires all judges and justices to not take part in proceedings in which their spouse is involved. But it is a sideshow. If you ask, what did we really learn? What we learned is how the pieces fit together. We learned that all of the talk about a stolen election was just hot air. Nobody could find any evidence of it. The president kept claiming that there was a big steal, but everybody around him, the attorney general even, uh, told him, Mr. President, that is just, in the attorney general's words, bullshit. There's no evidence to back you up, and he basically didn't care. So we've learned that, that it's absolutely clear that all the stuff about the election having been stolen isn't true. But quite apart from that, we have learned in great detail that whether it was true or not, the laws in place for deciding who was the next president were laws that this president, the 45th president, Donald Trump, was quite eager to violate if that was the way he could stay in office, if that was the way he could seize and hold on to power. So he finds this weird lawyer digs him up because it's really hard to find any lawyer who would possibly argue that the vice president of the United States has unilateral power to name the next president. That would have been good news for Al Gore in the year 2000 when he played the role that uh, Pence played this time. It would have been great news for Richard Nixon uh, in 1960. It's crazy. It's not, you know, when people say the legal theory is, is not right, that makes it sound fancy. It's not fancy. You don't even have to go to law school. Ask anybody, fourth mm -hmm. grader. Do you, do you think that in our system of government, one person picks the next president? It's ridiculous. There's no basis for it, as Judge Ludwig pointed out. And what we've learned in that connection is the president knew it. But mm -hmm. the lawyer he found to concoct and other theory uh, told him ultimately in front of the president, told the president's aides, we would lose nine zip in the U.S. Supreme Court uh, if it really came to that. But here's the weird part. He then said, but not to worry, because the court, he promises, would not take part. Now, maybe his friendship with uh, Ginny Thomas has something to do with his inner view that that's what would happen. But what does it mean? What it means is we can get away with, I was going to say, get away with murder. That's usually just a metaphor. But in this case, when we look at what I regard as the smoking gun that came out during the hearings, that uh, tweet from the president at 2.24 in the afternoon, after he had seen mm -hmm. that this mob was really riled up, they were talking about dragging people out to the gallows. They were talking about killing the vice president, killing the Speaker of the House. They're all riled up. And then he says to them, the vice president who is in that building that you're about to break into, he is a coward. 
He's not going to okay. keep us in power. Now, remember, this is a group that he's already told uh, that the election was stolen. Now he's telling them that the process for deciding whether it was stolen is being abused by a traitor, that none other than the vice president. When you put it all together, it's overwhelming. And I, I think that uh, Susan was right when she said that the impact of all of this being seen by tens of millions of people is that it's not going to be quite as shocking when the attorney general decides to approve a prosecution of the former president. Increasingly, it's going to be shocking if he doesn't. People will be stunned right. to know that in our system of government, there is one person who, once in that Oval Office, can violate whatever laws he wants to stay there forever. The business about two terms only, what does that mean if the president can just right. violate the law and get away with it? Hi, I'm Zerlina Maxwell. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more from Zerlina by clicking any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thanks for watching.